before everything else, I'd like to express my happiness that all of you have come here to this place and have come in the way that you have come, which means that you have come here in order to find and discover the highest thing which human beings can receive. That highest thing which human beings can receive, we can call it something which it is called in other religions also. We can call this highest thing a new life or a new world. A new life or a new world. What is standard for most of us is just to allow life to go along in the old way, the old life, under the influence or under the power of things we call the gilesa, gilesa, mental defilements, mental pollutions. So the old life just goes along under the influence of the gilesa or the influence of the instincts. Man has developed in knowledge to a point where there is the ability to get out from under the influence and power of the gilesa, of what we call the mental defilement. Before this knowledge was developed, all that man could do was go along under the power and influence of the gilesa. Man knew nothing better. And because of this lack of knowledge, the end result was always what we call dukkha. Unsatisfactoriness, unpleasantness, unhappiness, suffering. But now there is an ability to get out from under the weight and influence of the gilesa and out of dukkha. This kind of knowledge we call Buddhism. But let's be very careful about this word and not stick any preconceptions on it. The word putta or puto means the one who knows, the one who is awake, the one who has opened up to truth. This is not a specific individual. It is a quality or a virtue. And anyone who can open up, who can receive this quality and virtue, that one can be putta. We often call this Buddhism, but there's a shorter word that we can use as well. This word is Dhamma. Dhamma means the truth or reality of nature. When we talk about the law of nature or the truth of natural things, this isn't limited to any specific race, language group, ethnic group, or religion. Everyone who is born according to the law of nature must live according to this law of nature. And so when we're talking about Buddhism or Dhamma, it applies to all of us who must live under the rules laid down by the law of nature. An example of the universality of the law of nature is that for everyone, when we eat sugar, it is sweet. When we taste salt, it is salty. And when we taste vinegar, it is sour. 
It doesn't matter what country we are born in, whether we are male or female, what our religion is, or what language we speak. For everyone, salt is salty, sugar is sweet, and vinegar is sour. This is an example of the, the centralness and universality of the law of nature. Or we can take an example of something which man has produced, modern medicines. Doesn't matter where we come from, or our language, our religion, our ethnic group, our education, or class. When we take or use a modern medicine, whether it is an antibiotic, an antiseptic, or some anti-something else, it will have the same effects on all of us. So those were two examples of some, some things that are universal to all human beings. There's one other thing. In all the universe, there is something common to all humans. This is dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, unpleasantness, unhappiness, or suffering. And the total end of dukkha, the end of that unpleasantness, unsatisfactoriness, unhappiness, and suffering. This, this truth of dukkha and the end of dukkha is a reality for all human beings, regardless of religion, class, education, sect, or whatever. This Dhamma of Dukkha and the end of Dukkha is something universal. Please excuse us for using this word Dhamma, but we don't know what to translate it as. We can't think of an, other, of an English word that would fit the word Dhamma, so we will use the word Dhamma. This Dhamma of Dukkha and the end of Dukkha applies to all human beings. It is relevant to each and every one of us. We can look at the word Dhamma in four aspects or four meanings. The first meaning of the word Dhamma is nature, the things around us and including us. The second is the law of nature the natural law of how all these things work. The third meaning is the duty according to the law of nature. And the fourth is the result or fruit of doing that duty, of living that duty. So we can summarize these four meanings as that which we must know and practice according to the law of nature. Of those four meanings of Dhamma, the third is the most important. Duty is the most important meaning of the word Dhamma. This is something we have to know in order that we live correctly. If we live correctly, we will live free of dukkha. So we must know what this duty is, the duty according to the law of nature. If we wanted to have one definition of the word Dhamma that goes along with these, these four meanings, we could try the following. Dhamma is the system of practice that is correct and proper toward the evolution of human beings in all stages, on all levels, and in all aspects of that evolution of human beings. If we would like a shorter definition than that, we can say that Dhamma is what raises up, what lifts the practitioner up so that 
the practitioner, the practicer, the liver of Dhamma doesn't fall into dukkha, into suffering. Without Dhamma, one would just go along without any controls or limits according to what we call the instincts. One would just follow these instincts which would sooner or later lead to dukkha and lead to problems, illness. You've all heard about instincts, but let, let's correct your understanding of these a little bit. You must come, to, come and see that the mother instinct of them all, the one instinct that gives rise to all the other instincts, is the egoistic concept, the ego belief, this instinct that we all have of, of thinking in terms of ego, in terms of I and mine, in terms of myself. When this instinct arises, when this ego or self instinct arises, it, it expands and grows into selfishness. And from selfishness, arise all the other instincts. And if these, these later instincts are not under control, they will lead to problems. They will cause dukkha. This mother instinct or of egoism in the Pali language we call asami mana, the, the distinguishing, the giving importance to I, the distinction that there is an I. And this, as it grows into selfishness, will start orientating the I towards behavior that is seeking one's own benefit, regardless of what is harmful or beneficial for others. And so this selfishness will lead to problems both for oneself because this ego will never get everything it wants and so it will be dissatisfied, it will experience dukkha. And because of the selfishness, it will step on others, it will do harm to others so that others also experience dukkha. And so this, this ego belief and selfishness end up causing dukkha for oneself and for others. Cause it, it makes dukkha for everyone. Selfishness gives rise to the mental defilements, the gilesa. When there is liking of the self, of selfishness, this leads to lopa, greed. When there is disliking of the self, this leads to tosa, anger, or hatred. And when there is confusion of whether to like or dislike the self, then there is moha, delusion, ignorance, confusion. So selfishness is the root of the gilesa. There are many gilesa. We've mentioned three, which are the sort of summary of all the others. These gilesa come from selfishness, from egoism. If egoism can be cut off, then the gilesa will no longer arise. So we must be very interested in egoism and see if we can find a way to to cut it off. For those of you who are Christians or have studied Christianity in the past, I'd like to point out something very, very important. The Christian symbol of the cross 
has great meaning for the Buddhist. The cross has an upright, which is the I, egoism. And the cross, peace on the cross, is the cutting out, the cutting of the I, of egoism. This has tremendous meaning for the, the Buddhist. The Christian cross is something very useful for reflecting on in the practice of the, the cutting of egoism. This mother instinct of egoism, of atami man, mana or atta, atta, this egoistic belief gives rise to other instincts such as when there is egoism, this, this ego wants to continue. So there is the survival instinct. And there, to do that, there needs to be food. So there is the instinct of searching for food. And there is the fighting instinct when this ego is threatened. Or when it's unable to fight, then there is the flight instinct, the instinct to run away. And there are many other instincts which arise out of the egoism instinct, such as boasting about oneself and things like this. We can call these the instincts or we can call them gilesa. We have to see that these things are the most important things to us because they cause our problem of dukkha. And for this reason, we must learn how to deal with them, how to limit them, how to, how to cut them off. If you examine these instincts, you'll see that they are something that we cannot stop. We can't just abandon the instincts <clears throat> because the instincts are what keep us alive. The instincts are necessary for life and for survival. Therefore, the object is not to get rid of the instincts. But if we continue to examine these things, we'll see that when they are out of control, when there are no limitations on the instincts, then they lead to selfishness, and all the problems that arise from selfishness, which are the gilesa. So the instincts which are out of control become gilesa. But we can also see that these instincts can be put under control. They can function within limits so that they are not excessive or too much. And when the instincts are within reasonable limits, then they become poti, poti. So the instincts can go in two directions, towards gilesa or towards poti, towards defilement or towards enlightenment. If we examine nature, we can see that it has two levels. There's low-level nature and higher-level nature. Now the instincts, the basic instincts, are neither high nor low. They're just in the middle, and they go towards survival. The instincts are for survival, nothing more. This is neither high nor low. Now the question for us is whether to follow the instincts on the low level of gilesa or on the high level of poti, enlightenment. The question for us is whether to pursue the low level which takes us to dukkha to despair, anguish, fear, worry, lamentation, grief, and things like this, or on the high level 
of poti, which is the end of dukkha, freedom from dukkha. This is why we need to be interested in the Dhamma, because the Dhamma is what is happening with all this. The Dhamma is the way of practice that enables us, enables us to pursue the high level of nature rather than the low level, and by doing so, to be free of dukkha. Right now we'll have to take a little time to see how the instincts cause the gilesa. So we'll look at when an infant is born from his mother's womb or her mother's womb and enters the world. At that time, the instinct, the infant only has instincts for survival. But once it is in the world, it comes into contact with various things, such as food or things that, that entertain it or coddle it or take care of it. So then the infant, the, ch the very young child, comes to know good tastes and bad tastes, delicious tastes, unpleasant tastes. It comes into contact with things that it likes and things that it doesn't like. And these develop tendencies to love and to hate, to like and to dislike. And these tendencies are the gilesa. At first, the child was born with only basic, fundamental instincts for survival. But through contact with the world, ignorance develops and this ignorance is the tendency to like and to dislike. When we can't control this liking and disliking, then we just act according to our likes and dislikes. Instead of acting wisely or with understanding, one just follows these impulses of liking and disliking. And then, so, then behavior becomes completely selfish. One's actions are completely egoistic. We don't like someone, so we just kill them. Or we like someone, we fall in love. These things are no longer under control, and they go towards too much. They become absorbing and get go beyond reasonable limitations. And so selfishness gives rise to a world in which there are people hoarding wealth while many people are starving, or people who are just chasing after their sensual pleasures of sex, food, clothing, holiday vacations, and things like this. There's competition, there's fighting, violence, both in the level of families or in communities, and very obviously on the world scene. So all this selfishness, all this liking and disliking out of control gives rise to a multitude of problems, which we can see on a global, on a national, and even in the small social scale of our families or circle of friends. But most of all, we can see the problems it, ju it causes within our own mind, how the liking and disliking, this tendency to always judge something in a selfish, egoistic way, we can see how it disturbs the mind, 
how it's constantly interfering with peace, with coolness and calmness. We can come to see that there can never be happiness while there is this, this egoistic, selfish tendency to like things and dislike things. We read the newspapers and we can see the terrible extremes that develop out of this tendency to like and dislike. But if we examine within ourselves, we can see the, the constant annoyance and disturbance that this causes within ourselves. Just let us emphasize once more that all the crises in the world at this time have been caused by our inability to control the instincts. So let's look at how the neutral basic instincts become gilesa, how the basic instincts become a low level of nature, the low level instincts which cause problems. Let's start with what we call the ayatana, ayatana. There are internal ayatana or internal sense organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, tongue, the body, and the mind. There are six internal ayatana or sense organs. There are six external sense objects, the external ayatana. Sights, sounds, smells or odors, tastes, bodily sensations, and thoughts or mental objects. So there are six internal sense organs and six external sense objects. These form six pairs of ayatana, the eyes and sights, the ears and sounds, the nose and smells, the tongue and tastes, the body and physical sensations, and the mind and mental objects. Now there are these six pairs. Let's take the first pair, the eye and forms or sights, things that can be seen, visual objects. Take this first pair and look at it. When there is the eyes and there is an object of sight, there arises seeing when eye consciousness arises with this pair of internal sense organ and external sense object. So there is the pair coming together and eye consciousness seeing arises. When these three meet, we call this patsa contact. This moment of contact is very, very important because if at the moment of contact there is mindfulness and wisdom, things will go okay. But if at that meeting of sense object, sense organ, and sense consciousness, at that moment of seeing, at that contact, if there is stupidity, foolishness, ignorance, then there will be problems. So let's watch what happens when there is patsa or contact, which is stupid. If there is stupid or foolish contact, there will be a mental reaction towards that contact of either liking, disliking, or 
confusion of whether to like it or dislike it. We call this Vedana, which is often translated feeling. There are three kinds of Vedana, liking, disliking, and not knowing whether to like or dislike. From these Vedana will arise desire, Danha. In Pali, we use the word Danha. If we like the thing, if there's this pleasant mental reaction of liking the sense contact, then there will be desire for that thing, for trying to get. Or, if there is disliking, then the desire to get rid of will arise. So uh, there, these desires arise. And once desire arises, then arises a feeling of the I, or the, the feeling of an ego begins to develop because there is the desire and then the one who desires, who wants to get or wants to get rid of, this begins to develop and then becomes the full-born ego. The ego is born. And once there is this ego, it starts laying claim to everything in the world, saying, oh, this is me, that's me, that's mine. Starts claiming everything. When there is this big fat ego claiming things as me or as mine, then this ego is ripe for dukkha. And this ego will experience problems all the time. So this is how the basic neutral instincts drop down onto a low level, the, lentil, the level of the mental defilements. We need to understand this if we are to have any hope of freeing ourselves from this, this cycle, from this habit of desiring of egoism. So this is how egoism arises, and we need to understand that arising. We have to see the problems that it causes. This moment of contact, the moment of contact, that meeting, sense organ, sense object, and sense consciousness of seeing or hearing, tasting, smelling, sensing, or thinking. This moment of contact is the most important moment. If we are training in mental development, if we are practicing vipassana, insight meditation, if we are practicing vipassana, insight, if there is pawana, mental development, if we are training these things, developing them, then at that moment of contact, there can be four things. Sati, Sampajanya, Samadhi, and Banya. If at the moment of contact, Sati is present, if it's quick enough to govern, to oversee this contact, then Sati draws on Banya, wisdom, the knowledge and insight which has been developed through vipassana, through meditation practice. Sati brings this wisdom to the contact, and then that contact is governed by wisdom. It is not stupid. It is wise. And so there is wise contact. 
this wisdom which is in the action of governing the contact we call sampajanya, wisdom in action. Wisdom is an incredibly large thing. It is stored up throughout our lives. But sampajanya, wisdom in action, is the specific knowledge necessary to deal with a specific contact. So sampajanya is much more limited. And with samadhi, the one-pointed mind, this wisdom is able to do its work with great power and strength because the mind has been trained and knows how to summon its energies and abilities. So if at the moment of contact, sati, sampajanya, samadhi, and banya have been trained and developed, then they can, they can govern that contact. When there is wise contact, then there is no stupid vetana, there is no foolish or ignorant mental reaction to the sense contact, so that if there is something likable, there is no liking. If it is something disagreeable, there is no disliking. Hateful things are not hated. Lovable things are not loved. Instead of following the old habits of the ignorant mind, there is wisdom. So there's just seeing or hearing or tasting or sensing or thinking. When there is no more of this ignorant reacting, then there are no desires to get or get rid of, to be or not be, to have or not have. And when there is none of this desire, the one who desires, the desirer, does not arise. So the egoistic instinct, the ego belief, the I, the big me, the great I am, does not arise. So there is nothing to lay claim to everything in the world as me and mine, as I and myself. So the instincts have been developed in the way of poti, enlightenment, wisdom, understanding. And one has avoided the low track, the low level of gilesa. The low level leads to dukkha, but the, the level of poti, of enlightenment, where sati and wisdom govern the moment of contact, this, this is freedom from dukkha. When there is, a, there is contact, sense contact, one knows what to do. The right thing is done in regards to that sense contact. And then there is no dukkha, no problems. What we were just talking about was one example of what happens when the eye sees something or the other kinds of sense experience. It's, an, it's a description to help you know where to study in your own meditation practice. So you can do that and see, see for yourself how it works. In summary, We've explained how the neutral instincts become, can get derailed into the lower level of gilesa and thereby lead to dukkha. 
where the instincts are are allowed to get out of control and grow into desire and attachment, into egoistic attachment. When there's the ego or the self or the soul, this is called the old life. It's the heavy life. Because when, when we must walk around carrying along this ego, we find out it's a very heavy thing. It's like a, it's like a big rock, one of these boulders on our back. The self or the soul is a very heavy burden, constantly weighs us down and tires us. Even the biggest diamond or jewel in the world, if we have to carry it around all the time, will be a burden. So this attachment, this identification to things as I, is a heavy burden which weighs us down and causes dukkha. This is the old life. But when the instincts are developed in the way of mindfulness and wisdom, then life is much lighter. Instead of carrying around these burdens, these heavy weights, we, we put them down. Life is more, is lighter, freer, more peaceful, more skillful. Because life where there is no ego, where there are no desires growing out of the sense contacts, and then no egoistic beliefs, no attachments growing out of the desires, then there is no ego, no self, no soul to burden life. The mind doesn't have this heavy weight. The mind is free, peaceful, light, very skillful. The mind can act much more skillfully when it doesn't have this burden. This is new life. Old life is burdened and heavy with the self, with attachment. New life is free, light, skillful, wise. The difference between old life and new life is something that must be understood. Now, we want to make something very clear to avoid any misunderstanding, because one of the things that has been said goes against common sense, it goes against the general logic. The way we described it, first arises desire. Desire is an emotion or a reaction of the mind. Then this desire conditions a further mental reaction, which is the attachment to something as I or as mine. So be very careful and see that first is desire, then the desirer, the ego, the ego that desires, the attachment. First desire, then desire. Common sense, for many, would think that first there is the desirer and then desire. First, there must be someone to desire before there can be desire. That is what many philosophers might say. But if we really examine the mind and see how this process works, then we can see that desire arises first. 
and only after there is desire is there this egoistic attachment, the identification of things as I or mine. This, this distinction right here points out very, very clearly that there is in reality no self or no soul, that ego is only an illusion. All the ego is, is this reaction of the mind to desire. Desire arises, and then this illusion of ego arises. There is nothing at all real about the ego. It is just something we've been believing in for all these years with, because we haven't really examined things the way they are. So please understand this point, and then it will enable you to come to realize that ego, self, soul, is only an illusion. And when we see that this is an illusion, then we don't have to carry it around all the time, and the mind can be free, light, and happy. We've spoken enough about what the new life is. You should have an idea what it's about. So now we'll take the time that is left to speak about the results, the benefits of new life, of the new life. And we will speak of four benefits of the new life. The first benefit <clears throat> is we are not under the power or influence of the gilesa, the mental defilements. The instincts don't tend in the lower way. Instead, they're directed, they tend toward the higher path of poti. So we can summarize this first benefit as we are above rather than under. We are above the power of the gilesa. Let's, let's talk about these gilesa a little bit. We can, under the word gilesa or mental defilement, there are four groups or categories of gilesa. The first one is the in Thai, niwan, or in Pali, nivarana, which is usually translated hindrances. The second are the gilesa themselves. Then there is a third group, which we call the anusaya, the tendencies. And the fourth, the asava, the asava, or the, the cankers, or the outflows. So there are four groups of the gilesa. The nivarana, the hin nivarana, the hindrances, the first group, are a mental defilement which is, doesn't need an external object to call them forth. They arise from within all by themselves. They arise from within, from the anusaya, which we'll talk about in a little bit. They're not dependent on external things, external objects or causes. The cause is internal. These nivarana are not as hot. They're not as powerful as the full-blown gilesa themselves. So sometimes we could say they're half gilesa. And these nivarana, there are five of them. The first is thoughts of sense objects, thinking about sensual desires and pleasures. The second are thinking in thoughts of anger, of hate ill will. The third is, is a dullness of mind, 
lack of mental energy. The fourth is mental agitation, too much energy. And the last one is mental uncertainty or doubt. These five nivarana disturb and annoy the mind a great deal. If you, by, exa- by keeping an eye on your own mind, you'll begin to see what a annoyance these things are. It's very important to come to know these nivarana because they're present all the time, every day in each of us. They're not these big crises which only come now and again in our lives. The nivarana are little pestering, annoying defilements of the mind which are constantly bothering us. Not all the time, but much of the time. So we need to see these things. If we don't have any understanding or realization of the nivarana, it's ridiculous to come here and practice vipassana. It's like going to the doctor when you're, you don't know what's wrong with you. Or you don't even know if there's anything wrong. As far as you can tell, there's nothing wrong, but you go to the doctor anyway. You don't know why. You just go. You waste your time, you waste your money. You waste the doctor's time. But now, if you know there's something wrong, then you'll go to the doctor intelligently, wisely. And so vipassana is a cure for these nivarana. So we have to see these nivarana as they are disturbing the mind in order to be practicing vipassana in any intelligent way. We don't just do this vipassana because somebody tells us it's good for us. That's just blind faith. But if you pay a little attention to the mind, you will notice these nivarana because there's not one of us here who's free of them. And when we begin to notice these nivarana, then we'll have a good reason for practicing vipassana, for doing meditation. Second category is the gilesas. Now we're calling all these things the gilesa, but now a more specific meaning is the full-blown, full-strength gilesa. These are much stronger, much hotter than the nivarana. These gilesa have external objects. This is the process we were talking about earlier of patsa, contact, leading to desire and attachment. So these, these gilesa are much stronger than the nivarana. There are many, many kinds of gilesa but we can summarize into three groups. The first group is lust or greed, the wanting of these things, trying to get them. The second group is pushing these things away, trying to get rid of, trying to get rid of things. The second group of gilesa is hate, anger, things like this. The third one is sort of confusion, a spinning around of indecision about things, whether or not what to do about them. And so there are many, many gilesa, but we can, in summary, we can speak of these, these three groups. The gilesa come around fairly often, but they don't, they're not as common as the nivarana but they're much stronger, much hotter. And when they arise, they're much more painful. They happen, but not not as often as the nivarana. 
if one is free of these dilesa, you can call that a new life. The third category is the anusaya. Whenever a gilesa occurs, it leaves a little deposit. These deposits are the anusaya. For example, when the gilesa of greed arises, it leaves a little bit behind. It leaves a familiarity with greed or with lust. It leaves a tendency to lust or to greed behind. Or when there is anger, a little deposit, a little bit of, of anger is built up. Or a tendency towards delusion or ignorance. So as the gilesa arise, they leave behind familiarity with the gilesa, tendencies towards the gilesa. And these build up within the sandan, which is somewhere deep in the mind, but I can't tell you where. <laughs> but the anutsaya pile up, and the more of them there are, the easier it is for the nivarana and the gilesa to happen. It's like a jar with holes in it, or a pot with holes. The more water you put in the pot, the faster the water comes out. So the more we pile up these anutsaya, the more gilesa and nivarana will be coming up. So this is the third category of, of <laughs> mental defilement. The fourth category is the asava, which means outflows is the literal translation, outflows, outfluxes. And so, like we were saying, as the gilesa are, leave a little something behind and these are piled up, the more and more these pile up, the more and more the anutsaya grow. Then the pressure builds up, as in a jar or a pot where, that we fill with water. The more water, the more the pressure which will force the water out at a higher speed with more strength. So here we have the gilesa filling up the jar with water. The jar that is filled with water is the anutsaya, and the water that's shooting out is the asava. So we have these, this is the fourth of these categories of mental defilement. So we practice the Dhamma in order to limit, to control, to overcome these four categories of gilesa so that they cause fewer and fewer problems. When they can be overcome or controlled, this is called a new life. The second benefit is happiness, genuine happiness. There are two kinds of happiness, genuine happiness and fake happiness. Genuine happiness is the, le the steady lessening of the ego, of atta, of this egoistic belief. This is genuine happiness. Fake happiness is something, is all the running around and chasing after sensual objects and sensual pleasures, which we really shouldn't call happiness. All this wanting and getting and all this, we should, instead of calling it happiness, we should just realize that all it is is getting lost in things, absorbing into things, being led astray by these things. It's not genuine happiness. Genuine happiness is cool, calm, peaceful. We don't have to buy it. It doesn't cost anything. We don't have to go anywhere special to find it. Whereas this fake happiness is hot, it's disturbing, it's confusing, it's difficult, and it's often expensive and dangerous <laughs> and causes further problems. So the second benefit of practicing the Dhamma is genuine happiness. This is a new life.
we can summarize this in saying genuine happiness doesn't doesn't cost any money. It doesn't depend on money. And so we've got money left over. Whereas fake happiness, no matter how much we spend, it's never enough. The third benefit is that we are we are ready. We are fit and proper to perform our duty. The mind has been trained and developed so that it is able to to do its duty, to do the work that needs to be done. And this work, we don't have, it doesn't matter whether this is the work of a layman, of a banker, a farmer, a policeman, a merchant, a tourist, or the work of someone who is ordained, a priest or a monk or a nun. This third benefit is that there will be, first, ability to do one's duty. Second, skillfulness in doing that duty. And third, appropriateness towards that duty. The fourth benefit, and the last one, is that it is appropriate for us to socialize with others or for others to socialize with us. When there is very little or no selfishness, no egoism, it is very easy to meet and mix with other people in a harmonious and friendly way. So, the fourth benefit is the ability, the, the and not only the ability, but the appropriateness, the desirability that one socializes or mixes with other beings. So finally, we can summarize all this by saying that a new life is when one is no longer under the influence and power of the gilesa or the instincts. When, when there is genuine happiness that comes from the steady lessening of the ego, when one is fit, able, and skillful in doing, doing one's duty, doing the duty that needs to be done. And when there is, one is fit and proper for being a friend, a companion, an aid, a helper for all other beings. These are the four benefits of a new life. So, we invite you all to be interested in Dhamma, to practice Dhamma, to clean up this mess of egoism, to slowly wash it away. This is what Vipassana is about the cleaning up, the washing away of the ego. So then we can all come to an understanding and agreement and promise each other that each of us will work at understanding and practicing Dhamma, at, at dealing with this problem of ego that we will develop ourselves in this way. We will each do this work and duty that each of us has to do. We can make this, we can have this agreement amongst ourselves so that each of us in this group knows that the others are working in this way. And so we can each get along with the work that needs to be done and we don't have to be worried about the others. And so we can all do our duties. We hope that everyone will meet and find a new life. And on this note, we request that today's meeting be, be closed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.